But you had a chance to speak with somebody about their near-death experience. Yeah, that's right. Let's check that out now. My name is Yvonne Noctigal, and during the surgery to remove a four and a half centimeter tumor, I was transported into another dimension. She said that she grew up a Christian. Regular churchgoer. But she didn't really know about all of the... Conspiracy theories. I call it just the occult and what it, they're tangibly doing and how it all pulls together with prophecy and the end times and whatnot. I wasn't aware of any of that. Since then, I've, be I've become, my friends call me intense. <laughs> the doctors told her that she had had the tumor so, for over um, seven yeah, years, for and it got to the point where she was so sick that she was just completely bedridden. The left side of my body became paralyzed. Now, this was December 2010. Christmas, I was, you know, pretty much out of commission I mean I couldn't I could barely get up to do anything at all anymore and was finally ended up at the doctors put me immediately in the hospital now she mentioned this was a four and a half centimeter mass and she needed to get into surgery right away the strange thing was when they came in to the room for the first time to tell me what they'd found on the CT scan when the doctor came in the room, he looked so nervous and he was so pale. And my impression was, oh, he's trying to tell me I'm dying. And I, I mean, I just read that from him and I felt this peace. That right then and there, that this peace was with me that I can't I can't even put it into words but I felt this love for that doctor and I felt so bad for him and uh, at that moment it was just the beginning of something powerful that carried me through this enti entire thing and so with this peace that was over her that can only be described as God's peace Yvonne helped the doctor tell her that she was going to die. <laughs> it was really sort of, um, yeah, it was, it was all very supernatural. Well, they moved Yvonne over to a special neurology hospital where they set her up with a neurosurgeon. One of the best surgeons in the United States, actually. And when she went into surgery, she tried to stay positive and encourage everybody around her because, again, she felt... This peace. Everyone around me was so upset and crying. My children flew in. Everybody was so upset because it really didn't look good. But um, I just had this comfort. I knew God was holding me. And it sounds... I don't know, Christianese or something, but it was real, it was tangible. And I had no fear. I had a brief moment of fear before the surgery, the morning of the surgery, where literally I believe the enemy came in and just tried to make me afraid. And, and I just recited scripture and sang praise songs and it quieted down and he was holding me again. And I knew whether I died or whether I lived, I was... He had me, and it was fine, it was good, it was all good. Once the surgery began, they made an incision. From my crown of my head to the bottom of my neck. Then they drilled a hole at the base of her spine. A little bit larger than a silver dollar. And they penetrated the membrane that sits between the two hemispheres of the brain. And approached the tumor that way because it was deep inside my brain. It wasn't right near the skull. And they had to pull the tumor out piece by piece using this tiny little instrument. I mean, I can't even imagine how they did it. Just crazy. And I guess the hole is still there. I know, they, when I get my hair cut, the girls, you know, they like to massage your neck. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Keep your thumb out of my brain. <laughs> so getting back to what she experienced, she was under anesthesia and... Surgery started, I guess, and, and uh, next thing I knew, I was sitting there and I was wide awake.
and uh, you know, it took me a second to sort of start getting my bearings. And I looked around me, and it was this was not a dream. This was very much I was wide awake. My thoughts were very clear, and um, nothing was, uh, you know, how dreams, little things fade in and out, and you can't quite put it all together. This was very realistic. I, I was in a place that wasn't the hospital room, um, and there was this, first of all, the beautiful colors of gold and auburn and these beautiful colors, what is this? This was a massive wing. What I was looking at, these beautiful colors were this massive wing, I would guess, what, 50 feet long? It was huge. And it was holding me. And I started to sort of realize that what I was seeing, what I was experiencing, oh, and I realized I didn't make it. Okay, and there was a, there was love, there was peace, like um, it's it's beyond it's beyond description, the love that you have when when you hold your baby for the first time. It, that love was directed at me, just this immense rest and peace and love and this or unbelievable I was so fascinated with this wing that was holding me and I knew I was being held by an angel and I realized that all this time that I'd been having that peace from the very beginning when the doctor walked in he'd been holding me already then he was already there and now I was just you know through the veil seeing what was there, but I was unable to see it before. And I reached down to try to touch this because the wing was made of something that didn't exist in this world. It was real, it was solid, it wasn't just spirit, it was, he had mass of some sort to him. And the best way that I can describe it sounds very much like all of the biblical descriptions of visions that prophets have seen of, of angels, but he was like gold, if gold were liquid and semi-transparent, or like a, a gemstone, if it was perfectly pure, you could, it was, it, it, there aren't words really to describe how beautiful what this being was made out of was. It is, brings tears to my eyes to even try to describe him. He was glorious, I guess that's the best word. I reached my hand out to try to touch him, to like almost like a baby, to try to feel what he was. It didn't occur to me that I didn't see my hand. A lot of things occurred to me afterward. But there, was, there were even um, like uh, veins, that, I don't know, I could see the, the tiniest structure of how he was made. I was able to see in, in a perfect way somehow. It was different than my eyes here were able to see. I was, that was all very fascinating to me, how I could see so intently. And I was just in love with where I was. <laughs> so this was good. I, he was carrying me somewhere. We were going somewhere, and I knew you know, I was going to meet the Lord. I knew that I was going to see Jesus. I was, I was so happy. I was so at peace. Thinking for a moment about my family, just they're going to be sad. They're going to be heartbroken. But the instant that I even thought about them, I knew, you no, know, He had them. God had them. They were fine. He was going to take care of them, so it was instantly no fear, no sorrow there. And um, and then it hit me, and this was this was a powerful, extremely powerful thing. That I thought, I mean, I thought back on my family, I thought back in this world, 
and um, everything everything that I'd ever done wrong had never happened and that's real hard to describe because there was some there, there was some sense of an awareness of that I had done things wrong of sin but it had never happened it wasn't just forgotten it wasn't just under the blood it had literally in this realm wherever I was it wasn't there you know it, was, it wasn't allowed to go there that was um, it was pretty mind boggling but you know I wasn't mind boggled at that point it was just I, I it, it's more mind boggling when I come back here and I try to you know think it through again there it simply was the way things were it was just separated that wow it never happened and I turned my attention back to where I'd come from the world and this also stays with me a lot this comes to me a lot that the world was I, I thought back on it and it, it was like that's all it was it was just this brief little blink in time it was this tiny little moment it was not at all this oh my goodness you know how we are so concerned about all the things in this world and our worries and our the things we strive for the things we are we think are so important to struggle for and travail over there I just thought, oh my gosh I had it all wrong it, most of everything there was complete vanity it didn't matter it was just this blip in time none of that even mattered and the only thing that mattered the only thing that mattered was that I knew Jesus Christ was all that mattered and I didn't even think about it in those words at that point it was more of a oh wow I understand you know I just I saw that and I saw I looked at every thinking of everyone in the world and how they were running around just in this artificial reality that wasn't reality at all and here I was outside of it and gosh I would have loved to tell them but you know here I was just that you know, none of it was real the only thing that was real is, is the Lord the only thing that was real is, is Jesus and um, if all my sins being never having never happened you know I think I really experienced my salvation like I'd never um, understood it before Now, it was around this time when Yvonne looked down and she saw a large mass of people. A crowd, but they didn't look the same as they look here. I saw things differently somehow, which is, uh, I'm sorry, it, that's really hard. I can't put words on it really to describe how like, things look different. But it was as though they were made of something which was not in the realm I was in. And they were almost like silhouettes, but they were three-dimensional. She said she could see them, but they were really dark, and she could see a faint light emanating from them. And they also had a, almost a, an aura around them. And somehow I perceived that they were, they were the saints. They were the, they were the Christians they, because they had the spirit, that same spirit, the same glow to them that this angel had and understood but they were talking to one another I didn't hear them I only saw them and one or two of them had their hands up in the air and I was just looking at them and, and that's when the angel spoke to me and he had a beautiful voice I can still hear it but I can't describe it it's just 
powerful and beautiful and gentle. And he said to me, the multitude is petitioning for you. Yeah. <laughs> it still makes me cry. And uh, it, it touched me, just, you know, really. And about that time, I felt a sensation in my leg, like an electric shock. And I thought, what? You know, I'm, how can I feel anything in my leg, right? And I realized, I'm, oh, they're, they're working on me. They're still working on me. And I, I was aware they're trying to bring me back. And so I, I was a little bit in both dimensions at that point. It's so hard to explain some of this stuff. It sounds so good. Sure, you're doing great. <laughs> it's an amazing story. Yeah, it is, I know. So, so I felt that, and... Um, at the same time, still just, I mean, my mind, everything about what I was doing was just, I couldn't wait for the next thing. If I share this story with people before, the, the things that a lot of times is people who have lost loved ones, is to comfort them that, you know, these children or those people that are in Christ, they are, they're not sad. They know you're okay, and they, they're, they're so excited about where they are. It's just like, this is the reward. This is the, ah, after, a, you know, if you're done with your work, you rest now. And it's, it, it's, it's joy. It's fulfillment, it's, and, and you're just excited. You're happy, it's like, oh, you know, what, what, what comes next? Because the beauty is just, you want to see more and more of it, and the love is like nothing you've ever felt in this world, in that presence. I believe it was just the angel's presence. Of course, he was, I don't know, that gets off in theology in your mind. I'm not sure I understand all of it, but the point being that it, I had no thought of going back. I didn't, I didn't desire to go back, and yet the multitude was petitioning for me, so. And then the angel spoke again, but this time he was a little different, he was more formal, like he was making a declaration, he was very proper, and, and he said, the petition is granted. That was it. And the very next instant, I mean, bam, I heard hospital sounds. Wow. <laughs> and, and at that point, were you back on the operating table or, or were you waking up? From no, the I was in recovery. I was back there and I heard the hospital sounds and I was, I remember I was squeezing my eyes shut. And I kept saying no. I kept saying, you know, no, no, I was in heaven. I was in heaven. No, no. I, I didn't want to come back. <laughs> let me go. Let me go. <laughs> I wanted to see what was next. I wanted to see the Lord. I wanted to see, you know, I was ready. I was just ready to go. <laughs> and, um, no, nope. keeps talking about being in heaven. And then, um, you know, I'm in Nashville here, and um, and the one nurse, she took my hand, and I don't remember her face, but I remember, I'll never forget her words. She took my hand, and, and she came down close to my face, and she says, Sweetie, you're, in, you're, you're at Skyline Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're not letting you go to heaven today. <laughs> It was just cute, just sweet, you know. She was just, nope, sorry, you're not going. Well, how how long of a period had passed from 
the beginning of the operation until that moment you woke up? And then how how long did the actual experience feel like it was? I would say time-wise, it's impossible to say because there isn't time there. Mm. In that place, it it doesn't make any sense, but it feels like the right thing to say that even though everything, you know, I just recounted it in an order, and it seemed like there was an order, there still wasn't time. It was all at once. It felt, to me, the feeling-wise, experience-wise, it, it felt like it could have been maybe a half hour, an hour, and it, it, it could have been a couple minutes. I don't know. And then and back here on Earth, what, how long? And as far as I uh, hear, you know, I, I spoke with a surgeon. Oh, this is important. Right. It turned out that when they were removing the tumor, there was part of it which was wrapped around a main artery in my brain. That's where the problem was. And as they tried to get the pieces that were tangled up in the artery there, that's when they started to have problems with my vital signs and and they had to um, back out and try and get me back at that point. So that was where it happened. And the the surgeon, when I when I asked him if they ever really lost me, he said, you know, they had they, the as far as he went was that um, they had some problems with my vital signs. That's as far as he went. Now she said that her husband and family, who were in the waiting room, they were in there for about five and a half hours, and they can watch her through a video monitor. But she said that at one point... The nurse sitting there turned the video so that they wouldn't see it. And she was real quiet. And it was strange because up until that point, the nurse was giving her husband a blow-by-blow of what was going on in the operating room. But all of a sudden, she just stopped. My husband finally asked, you know, is is everything all right? And she just, oh, it's it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, so there was something there that, I don't know. She asked a couple more times what exactly happened, but they wouldn't tell her. And she said unless she demanded that they tell her, they weren't going to let her know anyway. But, you know, Yvonne said that... It doesn't matter because I know where I went. I know where I was. So what's the takeaway here? What's your message to the people? I think there are three things that are the most important First of all, the salvation message. There is nothing in the world that matters besides knowing Jesus Christ. That is all that matters. I mean, absolutely all that matters. When it all comes down, looking back on this world, that's the only thing you'll regret, is is missing him. For those who have lost loved ones, if they know Jesus, know that where they are is wonderful that they're well taken care of, they have joy and love, and they're wonderful. Um, The things of this world, and that's really what my life's become about, and I've talked with you a little bit about that on email, and that is when I came back, everything was different, and I knew it. I'd had the experience of realizing the vanity of things, and and when I came to, of course, I was in a hospital bed for days, and then I was in, in bed at home for days. It was a, roughly a year of recovery. And as I looked outside, I was different. I knew I was different. I was keenly aware of the creation was corrupted, and I was different. And I kept saying to my husband, Mike, I'm different. I'm different. Uh, the angel that was holding me, I was still aware of him for weeks. I would talk to him. I could come in the room and I'd be talking to him. He didn't answer me, but I knew he was there. And I'd just, you know, share my feelings with him sometimes. I was just so acutely aware of this parallel universe that was there. and But the corruption of the world has never left me. The awareness of this fallen creation, the awareness of what the fall of mankind has done to this world, has never left me. And it is absolutely, this. it consumes me. I can't shake that. A few weeks later, when she was able to walk again, she walked outside for the first time. and I looked up and I, I asked my husband, I said, what are they spraying in the skies? What are they spraying? What are they doing? And he says, oh, you have condensation trails. And of course, I started 
to investigate that, and that was only the beginning, obviously, of digging into what's really taking place in the world right now on all these multiple levels and really being about, you know, Satan and those that follow him and bringing about their grand scheme and the horrible things they're doing to everyone, all of that. And I see it now, Lons. I see it like I can't. I see people, they're, they're slaves. And I, I mean, I understand uh, Romans chapter 6 through 8 like never before, that when a man is dead, he's free from sin. And, and until until then, where these bodies are, I don't know, this, this world is enslaved. And we're all too aware of that on this show. But uh, Yvonne also told us that when she first tried to relay this experience to people. It was my spirit knowing what I had seen, knowing what I had experienced, and I would try to say it, and there was this acute awareness of this body that I was now in, and how the words, when I spoke them, uh, were corrupted. That I was now back in this corrupted body, and that glory was very hindered by it, you know, from being translated into this world. Thank you, Yvonne, for letting us share your story. And thanks for listening to Canary Cry Radio. Make sure to tune in next time. But until then, think outside the cage.